I want to welcome Princess Amira Altawil of Saudi Arabia, who has come to the United States to spread the word about her philanthropy and her women's rights initiative. She is the wife of Prince Alawid, one of the richest men in the world, and one of her biggest allies in her advocacy for the rights of women and interfaith dialogue between Muslims and other people throughout the world. Welcome, Your Highness. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being on your show. You're here in New York. Uh, and you've got a lot of work to do during the time you're here. What are your main goals on this trip? Because I understand that you just returned from Paris mm -hmm. where you did some philanthropy there. Yeah. It's uh, definitely a, a, a trip that I'm very proud of because we just inaugurated the Louvre Islamic Arts Hall and uh, this hall showcases pieces of Islamic arts. We hope that through this Islamic Arts Hall that people get to see a different perspective of Islam, the real image of Islam, that it's about love, beauty. And at the same time, I'm here in New York to actually uh, uh, embrace that energy. Now we have the Clinton Global Initiative and the UN General Assembly, and there's lots of influential people. And you have a program called Art for Unity. Yeah. What is that? Uh, we focus on four divides, uh, the faith divide, hope, up uh, opportunity, and the financial divides. We try to bring bridges. You know, we're tired of hearing we need to build bridges, we need to uh, unite world cultures and religions and financial divides, but no real global actions have been taken, or the ones who have been taken may not have made such a global impact as they might have hoped. So this initiative is to bring leaders through an uncommon table to commit to actions to actually bridge the gap. So we have people in agriculture who are willing to, um, in the United States and in the Middle East, who are willing to have these agricultural projects in Africa to help uh, those farmers who are, could be uh, sometimes abused in these farms mm -hmm. to actually have a proper job with a proper, proper uh, pay uh, uh, scale. So that's one of, one of the many examples Opportunity is hoping to achieve. Okay, and then your work for Islam awareness, you've actually established Islamic centers all over the world, yeah. uh, and also at Harvard and Georgetown. Why those schools, and what do you hope to accomplish with the centers? Education is enlightenment. People get to judge when they're not very much aware of something. And that's why we have centers across six universities around the world. We're using education and arts to unite people together. I took a course about comparative religions and I learned about Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity and it opened my eyes and it added so much respect towards these religions. That's what we're hoping to do through, through these centers. And for the sake of full disclosure, I want to mention that your husband, Prince Alawid, is a significant investor in News Corp, yes. which owns the Wall Street Journal, which this show is a product of the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Uh, but he's been a big partner of yours. He supported your efforts. Uh, what do you respect the most about him? He's very passionate and driven, and he can be macro and micro at the same time. It's very hard to do. And together you've taken on uh, some big initiatives, uh, women's rights, uh, as he says that you're the first princess to really go as hard as you have on that issue. Tell me how you met him and how your life's changed since you became a princess. It has changed dramatically with it when it comes to lifestyle and uh, you know the social circle but it didn't change me as a person I'm still the same um, I'm very passionate about everything I work mm -hmm. with and I'm working now with two foundations global and local and we exist in our projects exist in 70 countries around the world so I'm very driven and I work really hard and uh, he's very supportive of the foundations and a lot of your work involves, as you say, sparking peaceful interfaith dialogue, building awareness about Islam. Mm -hmm. um, I personally believe that uh, there's been a rash of discrimination and misperception mm -hmm. towards Muslims in America, yeah. Yeah. particularly since 9-11. What are the biggest misperceptions that you would like to address? I think there are a lot of misperceptions. Islam is uh, about love and peace and you know there is more than 1 billion Muslims. There are 2.6 uh, Muslims in the United States. It's expected to 
uh, triple by the year 2030. You're talking about a lot of Muslims living among you. You have 600,000 students from Muslim countries living in the United States. They're living peacefully. They're embracing the American lifestyle, the American dream. And I see that uh, people who may have stereotypes, just open your eyes and look around you. They're just as normal as you. You're coming to the U.S. at a time in which there's riots uh, against the U.S. in the Middle East. Do you understand or relate to any of the frustration uh, and the violence that people are participating in? I in understand this unrest? it. Uh, I don't. What is it about? Okay, so you're talking about a figure that uh, the Prophet Muhammad we believe in, we love and we respect and admire and we consider is a role model that we need to follow. So it's sacred for us. And when someone uh, marks uh, our sacred uh, beliefs, it hurts. Now, some people can take negative reactions and some can take positive. I chose, with many people I know, that it's our job to enlighten the minds of those who don't know much about Islam and can judge uh, Islam in a negative way. And the, the tension also really, as we discussed, really emerges also from the United States. One example is this anti-Muslim video that was at the center mm -hmm. of the assassination of the Libyan ambassador. Yeah. What did you think about this film? And did you see it as freedom of speech by a filmmaker or an affront against Islam by an American citizen? I, to be honest, I was disgusted when I saw it. I did see it. and. Uh, I just felt so bad. Uh, I don't understand. I, I respect freedom of speech, but even myself, I consider other people's feelings even when I'm allowed to speak freely. I just didn't understand it at all. I was disgusted by it. You're really positioned uh, to be a bridge builder, and I can tell that your work is, that seems to be, you're indignant, if not self-righteous, about building bridges. Yes. What uh, has your experience been in America? How much time have you spent because you, you have a westernized approach and you're able to, to relate wet very well? I'm very proud of where I came from. I'm a Saudi girl, born, raised, learned English in Saudi Arabia. And then I acquired my uh, degree uh, in business administration from New Haven University. I traveled the world. I've been to more than 70 countries. It opened my eyes to many cultures. And so I, am, I consider myself a globalized citizen. And it taught me to build bridges and to become more tolerant and understanding. And I think it opens people's eyes when you learn more, educate yourself, and open yourself to other people's cultures. Let's shift the conversation and talk uh, about women's rights and your advocacy for women in Saudi Arabia. American women livid about the idea that women cannot drive yeah. in Saudi Arabia. We know about that. Uh, what are the biggest goals on your agenda? Because I know it goes much further than just driving. What are some of the other issues and what are you hoping to accomplish? Uh, you've said it, American women, it wasn't easy for them to get their full uh, rights and even now it's not as full as they want it to be. With us it's been three decades uh, uh, that we've been trying to acquire our rights. And to be honest with you, it's not going to be as easy as one would wish for. Uh, you're not talking only about government and policies, you're talking about a mindset, a culture, a religion uh, and a very conservative culture. Driving, yes, it is symbolic, but there are very important issues, like you said, that concerns us women, like civil rights, more fields in education, more fields in the labor force, and uh, more political participation. Uh, and it's amazing that women can be doctors and lawyers. They can fly planes, but they have to be chauffeured to the airport. Yeah. Uh, both you and your husband have really spoken out on this. What, what is your timeline? What is the ideal timeline for seeing this change. You mean specifically with the driving issue? Yes. My ideal timeline would be tomorrow. <laughs> I think, uh, of course, you need to have facilities and you need to kind of, uh, because, you know, if you think about infrastructure and how does it work when you allow women to drive, which could take months. Uh, but I think the society is ready for it. A lot of people could embrace that. Now, those who don't support driving, you don't have to drive. Just as simple as that. What is it about? I mean, what is the problem uh, with women driving? Lots of excuses, but even if I told, tell them to you right now, it doesn't make sense because lots of Muslim countries uh, allow women to drive. We're the only country in the world where women cannot drive. Islam actually encouraged 
that women are uh, participate in sports and they use transportation and women used to ride camels and horses the wives of the prophet used to ride uh, uh, horses and camels so it just doesn't make sense there's no excusable uh, answer for that it just doesn't make sense I was reading about a woman who actually was going to be uh, the victim of lashing mm -hmm. as a result of a decision to drive. Yeah. Um, people can be lashed for disobeying the law. Mm -hmm. um, since you've had so much exposure to the Western world, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about that practice, as particularly when used against women? That's a perfect example of how civil rights can protect us women written civil rights. It's not about driving. The judge who judged the lashing does not reflect the government, nor does he reflect the courts. He just decided that this is the punishment for her. And when the punishment got to the king, the king revoked this decision, saying it's not fair. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to happen. We don't want every decision to reach decision makers in order for people to get their rights. We want to have them written, us as Saudi women. It protects women with custody battles, it protects women from, um, like you said, if they encounter any problems with the government, which actions should be taken. And it does not depend on what a judge thinks or feels like in a certain day. Saudi is out of step when it comes to other cultures, when it comes to women, but then so much forward looking in other areas women making up 70% of university enrollees, mm -hmm. the highest percentage of female entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. What is it about the women there that keeps them motivated despite some of the oppression that they are experiencing? I think the main answer for that is definitely education. Uh, Saudi Arabia is among the top countries uh, in the MENA region with education. A lot of women are very well educated and a lot of them go on scholarships abroad. So they come back and uh, they graduate very empowered. They know exactly what they want. And now it is the time, you're talking about 60% under the age of 30, it is the time for those young women to take the lead and ask for their rights in proper ways. And ultimately the king, your husband's uncle, and his brothers have the power right now to declare that women be allowed to drive and also to really forge policies uh, and laws for equality for women. Mm -hmm. uh, have you talked directly with him and why hasn't he done it yet and what are you hoping to do with regard to pushing him to do more? The king is a reformer. Ever since he took place, he made many decisions that empowered women, including sending them on scholarships, allowing women for, to have political participation. So he made many decisions that really helped us women, whether with regards to education or opening more fields of work. Now, it's not just up to one man. You're talking about policies that affect millions of women in Saudi Arabia. It's up to government, ministers. It's changing a lot of mindsets. He can definitely uh, do a lot, and he did a lot, and I'm hoping that this process is accelerated further. How far are you willing to go? You're really stepping out on this issue. Do you worry about potential retribution, particularly from, from ultra-conservative Saudis who feel uh, that they want to keep things traditional? That may be the case if I was fighting the battle alone. I'm not. There's a lot of Saudi women who are very open to speak up, to talk to the media, to take roles of leadership. And it's a movement that's happened in my country. I'm part of that movement. And so you will have a movement of conservatives and you will have a movement of women empowerment. And so I'm not scared of that, from that at all. Do you think that uh, the next generation of Saudis in leadership, your husband's generation, will be more open and friendly to reform or less? They are already very open and friendly uh, to reform. Reform is taking place. Uh, no one is against reform. However, it's not as quick as the many young people in Saudi would want it to be. Now you're talking about the next generation, which is younger. Definitely the pace will pick up a little bit. I'm sure you, you get plenty of criticism at, along with the praise. Uh, what do you say to people who believe symbolically this is great, but that it will never lead to real reform? Depends. You're talking real reform in what? Uh, women being allowed to drive, the ending of the lashing practice, uh, and just the empowerment and the upliftment of the future generation of Saudi women. We're in a time where 
more uh, every time we get the same message repeated to us that it's up to the people that the people get to decide their future, that the majority grabs what they want. It's no longer up to a leader, whether he was conservative or liberal. When people want something, they'll voice uh, what they think and they will get it. Uh, do you see, um, as time goes on, the possibility of democracy, of ever becoming a democracy? Mm. Democracy is uh, defined uh, depending on which country you're talking about. In Saudi Arabia, people can speak their minds, they can express what they think, they can lobby for what they want, and they can get it. And you have the conservative lobby, which is a perfect example of how they get what they want. And now women in Saudi Arabia are starting to get together, starting to have that energy uh, in sync, whereby they set their priorities and they, they, they set how are they going to get them. Do you engage in activism as well in Saudi Arabia? And if so, what do you do? I try my best to enable leaders to lead. That's my main message. If I find a person who I know is a strong woman or a strong young man and they have something they believe in, but they need certain elements to succeed, I try my best to provide it in the best capacity I can provide. And you're building these centers um, and you, you talk about wanting to raise well awareness. Give me some examples of uh, what has happened at some of these events. Uh, you know, what we do with our intercultural initiative is that we try to bridge gaps through creative ways where people think outside of the box. For example, with the Islamic Arts Hall, I was standing next to a woman who was looking at this beautiful uh, Islamic rug and it was explaining a love story uh, about uh, uh, in, in uh, Islamic poetry. And she said, I never knew Islam uh, reflected love in their art pieces. And that was a moment where she changed a certain stereotype. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Where do the stereotypes come from? Bad representation. Uh, some people hijacked our religion. Lots of events taking place ever since 9-11. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are Muslims. And it's up to us now to represent it in a good way. However, at the same time, it's a two-way street. Those who judge Islam by what certain individuals did need to really open their minds, read more, get to know Muslims in their own neighborhoods, and they will see the true face of Islam. Would you like to see your husband become king one day, and what is the likelihood that that would happen? I, I don't know. It's a hypothetical question. Uh, I like to see Saudi Arabia in the hands of great leaders who really believe in the energy and in the bright minds of young Saudis. And you have plenty of time ahead of you. You're 28 years old. Mm -hmm. Plenty of time to work on these initiatives in terms of advocacy uh, and philanthropy over the next five to 10 years. What's your blueprint? As I said, enable leaders to lead. Already I've done some work whereby I helped a couple of people and now they're big organizations or small NGOs and I'm very proud of it. And I see them even growing further. That's what I want to do. I want to look around. You know, Saudi Arabia, we have 600 NGOs in comparison to 3,000 in Bahrain, which is much more smaller than Saudi Arabia. I want to see more NGOs. I want to see more civil society. Instead of speaking that we want this and we want that, do something. And so I just want to grab that energy and channel it through right ways where people can actually take action. What did you were telling me, what your name means. Yeah. Share that with me. Amira, uh, it means princess. I was saying that it's very ironic because in my country they call me Amira Amira. It's princess, princess. Uh, and uh, it's ironic because I'm born a middle class girl and uh, now I have those two names tied together. Did you have this vision for yourself when you were a little girl? Never. I wanted to be a doctor, heart surgeon and I was working really hard to do so, and then my life just changed dramatically. <laughs> Everyone has a purpose in life. If you get to fulfill it truly, congratulations. Thank you so much, and uh, it's been a lovely interview. And with Prentice Amira Alta Wheel, I'm Lee Hawkins for The Business of Celebrity. We'll see you next time. I had to get used to the comparisons uh, with players from different generations, comparisons with Tiger Woods, um, the expectations of people. 
So we involve the fans in our product. They feel like they helped create this, helped design it. And I think that's the case with our, our jewelry, our, our home, bedding, and, and that everything is, that we do. 